and did the conduct of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in fact harm Maya Kowalski? Yes. That was Maya Kowalski crying as the verdicts were read in her civil suit against John Hopkins All Children's Hospital in Florida after the jury found that hospital responsible for her mother's suicide. In all, the jury awarded Maya Kowalski's family $211 million in punitive and compensatory damages after the nine-week trial in Tampa, Florida. Maya's mother, Beata Kowalski, died by suicide in January of 2017 after her daughter had been kept in isolation at the Children's Hospital. Doctors there had suspected Beata might be abusing Maya by making up her pain symptoms, but she wasn't. Joining me to discuss the verdict in this case is Maya Kowalski, the victim, the plaintiff in the case, and her attorney, Gregory Anderson. Uh, both To both of you, thank you so much for coming on. Maya, first, I want to start with you. How are you doing? You've had some time now to process this entire thing and and really think about it and, and let it soak in. I would say that I'm doing pretty well. You know, unfortunately, the verdict doesn't erase what had happened in the past but it definitely gives us a little bit of peace in terms of moving forward. We know that our truth was heard. The yeses in this case seem to be very important to you. Uh, we watched as the verdicts were read. We, we saw the emotion from you. Talk to me about how important those yeses were. When the first yes was read, that is when I completely broke down. I mean, when I was told in the hallway that the jury had a verdict, I already started getting emotional. And then sitting in the courtroom and realizing that for me, it was like the biggest day of my life. It, I mean, that's what it felt like. So hearing the confirmation that we were in the right and my mom was vindicated, it meant everything. Tell me a little bit about your mom, if you would. I mean, you know, she's your mom. Uh, and yeah. she, you lost your mom. That's what this whole lawsuit was about. It was about you losing your mom, the, the way in which you did, who was responsible, and whether or not you and your mom were believed. Yeah, no, my mom was very incredible. I loved her with all my heart. We were so similar in a lot of ways. I think our personalities, I always joke like I'm a carbon copy of her because, I mean, I even resemble her in a you know, I think in every single aspect, looking at her old photos, it's like looking in a mirror. It's really weird, but she was pretty stubborn. I will say that I have that quality as well, but I know people have to like learn how to look past that and not get their feelings hurt. I mean, my mom just cared. She cared so much for her family. And I think if she was here, you would see that as well. Greg, the yeses were important to Maya, but this was a, it seemed to be an astronomical dollar amount for, for the award in this case. Were you surprised by the award that the jury um, gave to your client? A little, a little. It was within a range that I had contemplated. I thought it would be more on the punitive side, um, but as it turned out, it was about a perfect amount of money based on the appellate law. And it wasn't, it was uh, actually a little more than I expected on some of the compensatory damages, a little less. But if you read, if, if you were watching the trial and you heard those jurors' questions, you got a pretty good idea where they were going to go. So it wasn't a complete surprise. Something that uh, I think that needs some attention in this case is the fact, Maya, that you suffered from and still suffer from complex regional pain syndrome. A and a lot of people may not know what that is. Uh, so how are you doing as far as that goes? And, and let let's first start off there. How are you doing as far as, you know, dealing with and living with comp complex regional uh, pain syndrome goes? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm definitely doing a lot better than I was when I was 10, but that doesn't mean I don't face challenges. Even people in wheelchairs from the neck up, they look completely normal. Um, so it's kind of hard to gauge just by looking at somebody. And I think that's important to keep in mind, but I do still struggle, as you said, 
I have the same burning pain. I get lesions and I also suffer from different temperature changes that are so significant that, you know, even friends who hug me ask, oh, why are you so hot or why are you so cold? So it's very apparent that it's still there, but I just have to take every day, you know, slowly. And and some of this flared up during the trial, isn't that right? Yeah, that was like the big thing. I, for a couple, I would say like on and off, I would get lesions. But when trials started, that's when I would say like a calling, colony of them just like spawned. And it was not fun. And it's extremely scary. I wanted to be there in court and support my family. But at times it was, you know, choosing between my health and being there. You know, I I think a lot of people find this so confounding and unbelievable because as a parent, you do whatever you think is necessary to help help your child and you don't expect to take your child into a hospital. Uh, Greg, you know, you're you're a parent and and you expect to to go into a hospital and for uh, physicians to help your children and to listen to your concerns. And in this case, it sounds like those concerns were maybe being ignored or, you know, suspicion was being cast upon the family in this case. Uh, Were you surprised when you really dug into this case and saw what was going on? Yes. And the thing that got me more than anything else was when I dug really deep and learned that Maya had gone to Johns Hopkins actually even before the first CRPS real breakout had happened. And then we found out that she had been to some 17 different doctors at Johns Hopkins before this faithful October 7th, uh, 2016 visit. And so I'm looking through all these records and after Dr. Kirkpatrick, who was the expert that first identified it, uh, he identified it in September of uh, 2015. And after that, all of the hospitals, all of the doctors looked at it and went, yeah, that's what it is. It's CRPS. You know, and then and, and Johns Hopkins carried that through all the way until this one afternoon and evening. And all of a sudden, after all of that data and all of these different doctors' opinions, everything changed. That's what blew me away. Uh, you know, there there's something I want to talk about, and I know it's a, a really sensitive subject, uh, but you know, you you filed a complaint with a police department alleging and claiming, Maya, that that you were sexually assaulted during a a stay at the hospital. And uh, this is something that came up throughout the the course of the trial, or at least during the trial. Um, You know, Greg, tell me, first of all, what is the status of that complaint? Because they're they're not telling us anything about that as far as uh, how where the investigation stands. That's kind of standard protocol. Yeah, well, you and me both. Uh, We filed a complaint with the St. Petersburg Police Department, and we raised the allegations of the uh, sexual abuse of Maya. And we've been pushing them to uh, carry forward with Johns Hopkins. And so far, all they've wanted is more information from us. As a matter of fact, Maya and I are going to go give another statement on Monday, our second one. And the conversation's gotten a little heated because I keep saying, well, you've got a perfect description of this guy from my client. You know, how many people that look like this were on this floor at this uh, during these days? And then there's a big issue about where are any of the surveillance films from all of this? I mean, there's surveillance cameras everywhere. So we've been in a bit of a debate with the St. Pete uh, Police Department about how far they're pushing it and why they are or are not pushing certain aspects of it. But we're kind of used to having problems with that aspect of pushing cases. So we're filing a civil complaint. It's all ready to go. And for all I know, we filed it. Uh, I, I have, things have been going and gotten so hectic. It's, it's sometimes things get filed. I don't hear about it for a couple of days, but I know that we have finalized drafting the complaint. And if it's not filed already, we'll have it filed very soon. So we'll take up the matter civilly. We tried to take it up during the the main trial, as y'all know. Um, And the judge for, you know, we we understood his reasons, but um, we're going to take it up and follow it up civilly. We'll see how that how that criminal matter goes. So you're filing a civil complaint regarding the, the claim of sexual assault. 
Absolutely. Okay. Maya, how are you doing with that? Because you brought this claim, you filed a criminal complaint alleging this, and it sounds very traumatic. Yeah. The first time I brought it up was in the hospital at John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. I complained about it. It was ignored. I just thought, because it was never dealt with or taken seriously, that it wasn't significant enough. And I kind of just kept on telling myself that for years. It wasn't until Greg asked me about every single incident that happened at John Hopkins that I came forward with that story. And here again, you know, I brought it up and it just doesn't seem to be taken seriously. It's frustrating. I mean, part of me wishes I would have just kept it to myself because like everything, I'm being questioned. And finally, Greg, this case really isn't over as far as uh, the other part, you know, that the trial goes. Uh, You know, John Hopkins is, they're fighting this. Johns Hopkins is asking the court for a new trial. Most recently, the hospital has claimed that juror number one was biased because of the way the juror wrote the S's in Dr. Sandy Smith's name when relaying questions to the court. Attorneys for the hospital want to interview the juror, claiming he wrote his S's in a way that resembles the Nazi SS symbol, showing a bias toward the doctor and the hospital. They're alleging the most horrific things you can imagine against him. And I find it nauseating. So they're fighting in ways that, let us say, from our, we totally disagree with. As officers of the court, we fundamentally disagree with. And I'll be very interested to see how Judge Carroll treats this. Um, we're going to ask them to withdraw it. And we're going to ask it under threat, threat of sanctions. And we'll see what they do, but it's pretty disgusting. And, and that's just one of the motions that they filed. Um, we have on the 15th, as I think probably a lot of your, your viewers know, we have the motion for new trial they filed and their first and second, and maybe this is the third motion attacking juror number one, as he's become known. So all those will be taken up then, and hopefully we'll put some of this to rest. Well, Maya Kowalski and Gregory Anderson, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we'll continue to follow this every step of the way. Law and Crime will stream that hearing on the motion for a new trial on December 15th. For Law and Crime, I'm Anjanette Levy.